All right, let's take our Bibles, if you would please, and turn to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Repetition is a key to learning, so I'm finding quite often God moves in my heart to preach a message on something that I didn't get to cover in a Sunday school lesson. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did last week, and it's what he's doing again this week. Uh, after, after our Bible study hour this morning, I thought, man, I, should I do another week on that word? Because he sure could use it. What a great word. I mean, just... I uh, love the word diligence. So we're going to look at it again, but, but I'm going to uh, use it in probably one of the most important verses in the New Testament where it's used because it covers a lot. And so I thought I'd save that for the message this morning. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Let's start with verse 2. All right, Verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his, by the way, there's only one Lord, right? So there's anytime you see um, what the Bible says, according to whatever, of God um, and of Jesus our Lord, that's, those are verses that prove that Jesus is the Lord, that there, Jesus is God. All right, verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. So this topic is things that God gives us. He has given us all things according to his divine power. That all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So anything that you need for life, God has given you. Anything that you need for godliness, God has given you. Through the knowledge of Him. And this is where we get the knowledge of Him. So everything you need in life, about life and godliness is in the Bible. That's what that verse says. All right? Um, uh, through, the, uh, let's see, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and, and virtue. Now that tells us that God has called us to glory and a virtue. God has called us um, because He wants us in His glory, in, in heaven. He wants us to Him. See, we come short of the glory of God because we're all sinners. But God is calling out to the world, hoping that people will hear His message from the Word of God and put their trust in Him so that they can be forgiven of their sins and sins blotted out and therefore not be short of the glory of God anymore because they have God's righteous, righteousness imputed to them. But also he calls us to virtue. God wants us to do good things and uh, virtuous things. So uh, verse 4 says, Whereby, notice by, this, by that same power that he's given us all these things, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be Actually, it's by His divine power which gave us His Word. Where, um, that's how we know all the, the, that's where the knowledge of Him comes from. And it's through the knowledge of Him, that's how He gives us exceeding great and precious promises that comes from His Word. That by these, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So if a person is not, hasn't been born again, it's because they've not, if they don't know the promises in the Bible that come from the Word of God that by these enable us to be partakers of the divine nature. Now, something else I want to point out here, and it's not done everything in the message, but it's a good thing I've got to underline in my Bible. Very important, very enlightening statement here. So again, the subject now is, is the Word of God, which, which gives us the promises of God, and which allows us to know the things that we need to know to be partakers of the divine nature, know how to be born again. So it's talking about the Bible, it says, uh, so, so now, talking about the divine nature that comes as a result of trusting in Christ, it says, having per escaped the corruption that is in the world. So, when, we, when we're born again, that's how we escape the corruption in the world. Because that which is corrupt dies, see? But we, though our bodies may die, our soul can become uncorrupted and made whole and immortal at the appearing of Jesus Christ, because our, we've been born again, we're a child of God, so when our body dies, when Jesus comes, we go with Him. Our soul is saved because we're born of God. Now, but I want to show you something else. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's where corruption comes from. All corruption of the soul comes through desires. 
Does that mean desires are bad? No, it's just they can be bad. <laughs> In fact, another thing I was going to say about the song, uh, More Like the Master, is another false teaching that is, that is done mostly through songs, and, and the people don't mean, they don't mean it this way, but this is the way a lot of people take it. Uh, people try to, they want to be like, like the, like the song, more like the master I would ever be. Yeah, I want to be more like the master. But not that I want to copy his, his, uh, um, I don't want to copy his kindness, his tenderness, and, or certain attributes of people. Oh, we ought to be like Jesus, which means, you know, submit to anything and everything and let people kill you. And so, no, he died for us to pay the wages of sin. So we don't need to die for other people. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that's why Jesus told his, 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 his disciples, buy a sword. Why? He don't want them dying for him. He'd rather they live for him. But, but anyway, uh, so, so there's a desire. The desires can be wrong. And let me just point out so the first desire. The fir all the major sins in the world, all the corruption in the world comes from desire. Look at Satan. Lucifer. He said, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High God. I will sit in His seat. Why? He had a desire to be above all the stars of God. He had a desire to be equal with God. He had a desire to sit in God's seat. That desire led him to fall and be cast out of heaven. Look at Eve. How did Eve mess up? How did the devil use uh, Eve to get her to... Uh, what did the devil use to get Eve to disobey God? He used her desire. He said, oh, God knows. He said that. He said, don't eat of it because he knows the day you'll, you'll be as gods. I don't think Eve caught that plural. I think she, was, she caught half what he said or part. She thought, oh, God is wonderful. I'd like to be like him. Her desire to be like God caused her to eat that fruit. So, so here's what I tell people. Don't desire to be like God. Desire to obey Him. If you desire to obey Him, because He, when He came to earth, He obeyed the Father. Obedience always has developed certain traits. And as a byproduct, you'll be like Jesus. But when you try to be like Him by copying certain traits, but not necessarily to obey God and His Word... You're going to copy certain things and develop certain personalities that don't have the... You're going to copy byproducts. Don't copy byproducts. Copy the product. And the byproduct will come. See? So a lot of people try to act like Jesus, but they don't obey Him. If you don't obey Him, you're not like Him because He obeyed His Father. So, so when we sing more like the Master, don't think, I want to be more like whatever some character you think of as Jesus. Unless it's, he obeyed the Father. I want to be obedient to. I want to be more like Jesus than I do the will of God. That's key. Because otherwise, any other desire, um, the devil's going to use to get you off track and to corrupt your mind and corrupt your life. So, so, so we can escape the, the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's how it all comes. Look at politicians. They get a desire, what? To stay in office. And that leads to corruption. They get a desire to get in office. And so they do whatever they have to do to win election. I mean, everything comes through desire. All corruption comes from, from bad desires. Um, back when I was in the Republic, I, someone nominated me to be a representative. And, uh, and I, I don't have anything to do with that anymore, just for the record. Um, but, uh, but, but it illustrates something because I read the Constitution prior to, to this this and I knew it well and I got up and someone said uh, you want to throw your hat in the ring I said no I don't have a hat I don't believe in throwing hats in the rings I don't believe in running for office I believe in people choosing we need to quit having people run for office we need people to start getting together and say wow who do you think would be good for this and let them choose instead of someone because they got money or they got Influence or someone who says, hey, we want you to run because you'd be good because you believe like we do. No, let the people decide. People need to quit running for office. And people need to start supporting someone. And then like, who was it? Uh, 
was it Thomas Jefferson? Somebody, somebody who was an ambassador was in, uh, in another country, and they got elected, I think, to vice president. I'm not sure who. I think it was Thomas Jefferson. Was elected to vice president, and they didn't even know it until they got back. Oh, I'm vice president. <laughs> that's the way it ought to be. <laughs> and that's the way it was in the early days. Why? They followed the Constitution. But anyway, so, th so that's another example of lust. That has nothing to do with the message. I just... That has to do with just good stuff I can't resist talking about on our way to the message. All right, verse 5. And beside this, now that we know the context, beside this, um, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You sometimes feel like you're barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, then here's the rest, excuse me, here's a clear recipe how not to be barren, how to be fruitful in the knowledge of God and uh, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So let's, let's um, oh, look, got to read verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And that's not a, a good thing. So let's go back and review these. Um, well, let's pray first and then we'll review. Father, thank you for your word and help us to see the importance of, of the things mentioned here. Here's a clear recipe for how we can excel and, and grow and increase in our knowledge of you and of what's right. So bless us as we look into your word and help us to develop the traits necessary or the trait, a one single trait will help us with all these ingredients, all the ingredients of this recipe. So bless us, we pray, with that one ingredient that all the other ingredients hinge upon. <coughs> Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look at, break down the recipe. He says, he says, get with, he says, he says add to your faith. That's, faith is where it starts. You've got to believe God's word and believe and put your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior. That's first. That's the first base. People who try to get, get moral and get, uh, become temperate and become patient and, and godly and kind and have charity, they're not going to succeed if they've never been born again. It's going to be super fit, superficial. It's going to be like professionals who, who go to a charm school or go to, uh, what's that guy, um, making friend, how, to, how to make friends and influence people? Dale yeah, Dale Carnegie. They got to Dale Carnegie School and learned how to smile and learned how to, hey, how you doing, man? Good to see you. And what, what I call plastic men. They, they're perfect. They're professionals that, hey, hey, and they know how to pat you on the back and make you feel good. They, they learn all these tricks of the trade to, 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 to win friends and influence people. Let me tell you something. The most important thing is to, is to win God's attention and win God's, earn God's blessing to where God blesses you and God magnifies you in the sight of other people and God gives you favor with Him and with men. See, the Bible says that Jesus increased in, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. See, and that's something that God does. I'm more interested in getting God's favor than learning some tricks of the trade of how to woo someone or to make a sale or to get someone to do what I want them to do. Why? I'm not interested in getting people to do what I want them to do. I'm interested in getting people to do what God wants them to do. So I need to be in touch with God so I can help other people get in touch with God. That's... That's the secret. That way everybody can have their, their, their unique personality that God gave them in tune with their creator. And that's a whole lot better than everybody being in tune with me. See, <laughs> Brother Howells used to say this all the time. He said, most men are mental homosexuals. They want everybody to think the way they think. You know, I want everybody to think like me. Same way of thinking. No, I don't want anybody to be like me. I want you to be what God wants you to be. 
And I want to get you in tune with God. That's the thing. Too many followers are trying to, too many leaders are trying to get people to follow them. And they forget, Paul said, be followers of me even as I also am a follower of Jesus Christ. And what happens, religious leaders aren't following Christ, but they're really good because they're professionals. They learn how to get people to follow them. And then you have the blind leading the blind because they're not following Christ. So, so we got to keep things in the right perspective. So everything starts with faith. If you don't tag first base, it doesn't matter if you go all the way and, and hit second, third, and home. You're out because you never had faith. And that's what Matthew 7 is talking about. These people that stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and say, But Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils? Oh, they did all these so-called godly things, these religious things. And, oh, they cast devils out and they heal people. You know, the devil has power to heal people too. The devil has lots of power. And if he, he's looking for people who don't have faith in the word of God, but have a desire. And he'll give them power. Why? Because power is what attracts people. See? People are attracted to power. Everybody wants power. Everybody wants. That's why you like war movies. That's why you like to stop and look at a wreck. Ooh, wow. Why? It's a, that's the result of, of a powerful machine hitting another machine or person or, some, or building or something. And uh, we like exhibitions of power. We go to air shows. We go to gun shows. We, 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 we like sports where people have power. They can hit a home run or, or throw a touchdown or, or make a touchdown from a, from a kickoff return. And we love those things. We like power. And that desire, if we're not careful, is going to corrupt us. And so we, and so we got to make sure we tag first base, which is have faith in God. Trust God, trust God's word, and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior because you don't have the power to save yourself. All right? So faith is number one. Then it says, add to your faith virtue. And, and just a simple description. I'm not going to detail the, doing a word study on that. I don't have time. But basically, we'll just say it just means doing good things for people, doing, doing uh, good to others. And to virtue, knowledge. So here's a recipe. Faith, you start off with faith, then you add to your faith virtue. Then you add to that knowledge, and then you add to that, to the knowledge, you add temperance, and then you add to that temperance. By the way, te knowledge is what you know the Bible says, uh, what God says, because it's what, it's what you can know, because He says so and He never lies. Temperance is when you temper things and you don't get out of balance. In other words, you don't hear some people... Um, here's the guy who gets all excited about sowing. Boy, he wants to go sowing. So he goes sowing like crazy to where he's out sowing instead of during church time when he should be in church because he needs to get his heart, you know, stirred up and get balanced. And so you've got to be temperate everything. You don't do everything whole hog. You do everything the best you can when it's time to do it. And having different times to do to think, that's the temperance, see? So when God wants us in his house, then we go to his house. Stop going sowing. Stop doing other things that are good. Don't sit at home. Read your Bible. Be in church. That's, that will temper you. God has enough commands in here that if you obey them all, you'll be well tempered. Okay? So, um, all right, then, uh, so, you, so you got faith, then virtue, then uh, knowledge, then temperance, and then patience, and then godliness, number six, and then brotherly kindness, and then he added brotherly kindness, charity. So you've got eight things, if I counted correctly, eight things, eight ingredients in this recipe that God says, if you abound in these things, as verse 8 says, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, when you get all these things, you're going to start really knowing God and knowing a lot about God, understanding Him and His will and so forth in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're, you're, going to, you're, going to, you're going to have a good understanding. No one's ever going to be able to shake your faith. And people will see it. Now, but there's a key word for all this. How do we get all these things? It's not easy. There's, a, there's one other ingredient that's not really considered an ingredient, but it's, it's a necessary prerequisite 
for any of this, for any of them, including the first thing. And that is, verse 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. If you don't add to your faith with diligence, you're not going to add to your faith much. See? Because remember, our Bible study, and just for the sake of people who might listen to this message and, and not the Sunday school lesson, I'm going to review diligence just briefly. The word diligence comes, the root word is, is from, the, from the, I think, either Latin or, or Greek word, lego. It's probably Greek. And uh, so lego, it's where we get legos, the toys. And uh, the, the basic principle of lego is you have a bunch of pieces, and you choose one, and then you choose another, and you put them together. So that's what Lego is. People didn't know that, but it's, <laughs> it was a well-designed game and, 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 and a well-designed name, or well-thought-out well name, I guess. But anyway, because it's all about choosing which piece you're going to put together, and if you, choose, if you choose wisely, you can come up with some really not neat things with, with Legos. And by the way, if you choose wisely in life, you can come up with a great life <laughs> if you choose wisely. Uh, so now the, the, the prefix is the prefix dia, which means through, but they drop the A because it sounds weird to say diligence. Uh, so they just say diligence. And uh, they drop the A, but anyway, it means through so, or, or thorough. And when you go through something, you go all the way. You don't go part way because then you're just in it. So through means thoroughly, so completely. So it means to choose completely or choose thoroughly. That is be thorough in seeking what your options are and then choosing among several options and being thorough in your research and your reasoning and why you choose what you choose. That's what diligence means. So, for example, a person who works diligently is a person who, while he's working, he decides, shall I do it this way or that way or, or this other way? Uh, and he thinks about those that, nope, this would be better. Whereas the guy who's not diligent, first way he thinks of doing it, he does it regardless of how it turns out. Well, that's the way I did it. That's the way it is. <laughs> it's kind of like when I, when I started a church in Globe years ago, uh, first church I ever started, I, I, I heard a term, I got to know a small community, and I got to meet some of the people and talk to them, and I said, how come, uh, how, oh boy, this house over, what's with that? Hey, oh, that's one of those houses, yeah. You got to understand, boy, the miners back then, is all about getting gold and copper and silver, and, and, uh, and so everybody's in a hurry to get r rich. There's a saying back then, if it's, if it's half done, it's done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> done is half done. Half done is done. And, and so, so people weren't picky about how they built, why they're in a hurry to get rich. See? And by the way, how does that go with our Bible study this morning? The, uh, the, the he that is hasty uh, tendeth to want. The person that's in a hurry, who's not thorough, he's not diligent, he's going to lack some things. We lived, used to live in a house that I didn't talk to the people who built it. I just, we just lived in it. And as I started to work on it and fix things, and I found places in the walls where it was just paneling. And, and it would go like this. Why? They didn't have studs every, two, every 24 inches. Yeah, some place they had studs four feet apart. And just thin eighth-inch paneling nailed up there. <laughs> and so first time my wife shoved me again. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> first time I, I tripped or lost my balance or, or somehow was carrying something and I moved. I was amazed how far that wall moved in. So I thought, boy, I got to check that. I took the paneling off and oh, I couldn't believe it. It's just wide open, you know, behind there. So I, I, had, I, I, I had to work on that house a lot. So I got the, I developed after a while the idea, you know, this house is probably built on a weekend and the guys were probably drunk when they did it. <laughs> not a straight wall, not a straight corner. The floors, oh, it'd be great for kids with playing with their cars. They could just, there's one, our hallway, you could, our hallway dropped probably in, uh, in, in 12 feet, I think. It dropped probably six or eight inches, something like that. And in our bedroom, the first project I took on in our bedroom, besides insulating the walls, was to put in a new floor. And what I did, I just took the high point in one corner, and I laid a sheet of uh, flooring, sheet goods, and I laid it on there, and then I put my level on it, and I sh put shims all around, around it and in between until I got that sheet level. So that by the time we got to the doorway, we were like three inches above the floor. And that's just in one bedroom, and that's the corner. That's the corner of the house. 
And uh, it's like, boy, that house, it took me 11 years working on that house. Why? Everything was crooked. It, and, and that's why I learned a long time ago. That's one of the reasons I, I got in the shed building business. I want to build something from the ground up. I can't afford to build a house. I don't have that much knowledge at the time. So I learned how to build sheds. And, and why? So I could build a nice level platform and, or, or concrete, whichever the people wanted, and build straight, and I could build fast. I could build a shed in a week, you know. And uh, so, and that's working full time and doing it on, on the side. So I, I had fun, but, but, but anyway, so a lot of people are in such a hurry, they're not diligent. They don't search out, or they, they don't, um, they don't uh, choose thoroughly, they choose first thing that comes to their mind. Now, so therefore, with all diligence, you need to add these ingredients. So number one, let's take them one at a time. Faith. You've got to, you've got to choose thoroughly to put your faith in Christ. See, you've got to realize that you're a sinner and deserving of hell under the condemnation of the law of God, the law of sin and death. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The wages of sin is death, the soul that sinned it shall surely die, etc. The Bible makes it clear. We have to understand that. We can't say, well, I want to choose to believe in Jesus because I've heard there's a religion there of about, about a man who died for all of our sins, and oh, that sounds good to me. You better know why he died. Why he had to die, and who he really was. you got to you got to choose thoroughly. you got to research. you got to know what the Bible says. Don't just say, oh, that name Jesus. I hear people talk about it a lot, so I guess it's common. I guess I'll believe in it too. That's where these people come from in Matthew chapter 7. But Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works in thy name? And then Jesus says, then will I profess unto you, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Why? They never they didn't search, they didn't, they never got faith in a diligent manner. They just chose, just like I remember years ago, um, not years ago, um, well, yeah, it's been a couple years, I think. Um, I began studying about the history of, of Jews and so forth. And I came across uh, some information that, that I realized that there's a group of people in Asia, uh, near the Caucasian mountains, I think, I forget what the area is, I'm not that knowledgeable about the geography of, of Asia and, and uh, north of, north of uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and those countries, and, and uh, Iraq and Iran. But, but anyway, uh, what we call the, those republics of, of Russia, um, or the, the countries south of Russia. But anyway, years ago, I, I, I read that there's a, a group of people called Khazars, and they're trying to decide what they wanted to believe, what religion they're going to be. And so they researched a bunch of religions. They chose to believe in Judaism. So they proclaimed themselves all to be Jews. And to this day, many, and then of course they spread. And a lot of people think Khazars are Jews. And they don't know. They think, well, they see a Jew, hear someone say they're a Jew, and don't know it, but they're probably Khazars. In fact, sometimes after all, even the people themselves don't know where their roots are. Because of being scattered and so forth. So all, everybody claimed to be Jews. Not necessarily Jews. They could be Khazars. Who just decided to. T and they didn't. Now did they search diligently? Well they. I don't know how well they searched. But they did choose. But I bet they didn't choose diligently. I bet what they did do. Is they didn't search the word of God. So. What, what I'm saying is that. People need to search diligently. The average person. Believes in whatever their mom and dad taught them. The average person, the, usually when I go door knocking, I ask people, um, and it's, it's very rare, and I ran into one yesterday uh, who has changed from Catholicism to, Je to Jehovah Witness. And, uh, um, but she didn't diligently search, no. She just studied with Jehovah Witnesses, and they convinced her of some things. And I said, well, boy, I'd love to sit down with you and show you some things, show you what's wrong with Jehovah Witnessism. She said, no, no, not interested in that. Why? She's changed once. She don't want to change again. Look, it's not about how many times you change. It's were you thorough. If someone says they can show you something wrong with it, you ought to listen to it. If someone says, hey, I'll show you something wrong with what you believe about the Bible, 
well, show me. I mean, let's have it out. Let's sit down. Let's get our Bibles. Let's get dictionaries. Let's get uh, concordances. Let's, let's get all the evidence and all the documentation we need to search and, and see, see what's right. I'm not afraid to do that with anybody. I welcome it. Why? Because I've already done that diligent searching. I've already done the thorough choosing. See, I, mean, I decided when I was young that I wasn't going to believe what I believed just because mom and dad said it was so. So I began to search the Bible and, and, and research the Bible. And, and I got a computer and got the Bible on the computer. I did, did word and phrase searches. And the first study, major study I did is to see whether the Bible really is the word of God or not. Because a lot of people say, well, it's written by men. Well, I studied that out. I searched diligently. And I researched hundreds and thousands of verses. And I came to the conclusion, wow. Before I got done, but I finished anyway because I wanted to have, I wanted to be thorough. I wanted to be diligent. I thought, wow, this. Not just something years ago, but this that I hold in my hand really is God's preserved word of God. Every word of it. I mean, of the text. I, I was able to prove that through diligent study. Not reading what someone else says and believing what they say. No, doing my due diligence. So you've, we've got to be diligent to seek what God says and believe what God says. So faith has got to be arrived at through diligence as well. Then when you add to your faith virtue, you better do, do that diligently. You better better choose diligently whether and decide whether something's virtuous or not. Look for, look for examples in the Bible of what virtue is. Find out what the word means and then just start adding to your faith virtue, but do it diligently. Choose on purpose. Don't, well, whatever good thing comes to mind, I'm going to do it. Oh, well, maybe you ought to choose wisely and see what the options are and choose. Some things are good to do at certain times. Some things are better to do at other times. So in all diligence, add to your faith virtue, not just carelessly. All right. Then you add to, to virtue, you add knowledge. But again, knowledge, the Bible's full of knowledge. So you've got to choose uh, thoroughly what you're going to do. Just like when I, when I preach and, dis, and teach and when I decide I like to do a series, usually I have more than one in mind. And that's so I decide what would be best. I, I have a lot of different factors that come into it. And sometimes, sometimes I don't know. So I pray about it and I diligently seek God and ask Him, Lord, Help me in my decision-making process. Guide me. I'm going to trust you. And once I've diligently sought his face and asked for his help, then I make my decision. And I trust that he has helped me because I asked first. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So I always seek the will of God and ask for his help. And then I trust him to keep his promise. And I make my decisions based on what I believe he has led me to do. So, so add to your, your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge, but do it diligently. Th thoroughly choose. And then to knowledge, temperance. Temperance. Oh, temperance is like one of those... Uh, i going to get my measuring tape out here. Temperature. How many temperature? How many degrees are there in the temperature? <laughs> well, let's see. What's what's, what's uh, um, zero degrees on the Kelvin scale? Is it Kelvin? Is that right? The yeah, the absolute. Yeah, no, where there's no heat at all. That's way down there. That's really cold. So everything from there to I don't know how hot can hot get. We it's infinite. We don't know. But what I'm saying is there's lots of degrees. Lots and Lots and lots of degrees. So, so to temper what you do, temper how, for example, temper for, what are some things you got to temper? Okay. Huh? 
Oh, okay, you're talking about physical things. I'm thinking about things that we have to do, not make, but things that we do in actions, because we're talking about adding to ourselves temperance, not, you know, to steal. What? Sleep. Okay, yeah, sleep, all right. Do we need to sleep? Yeah, the body has to sleep. At least this body does, this, this uh, <laughs> corrupt body that we're born with. It has to sleep. So, now, how many people... Does the average person like to sleep? sleep? Is sleep pleasant, usually? For most people it is, all right? So, and the Bible talks about, you know, the slothful um, says, yet a little sleep, yet a little slumber, yet a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Uh, it's talking about people who who, you know, they're out for hire to fight wars, and, and if there's no wars, and they, then they starve. So, um, and, and so anyway, uh, and the people that are traveling all the time run out of money eventually. So, so it's talking about the, the, the guy who wants to sleep all the time is going to end up being poor. So a person has to temper their sleep. They can't say why. Well, they they got to say, I want to sleep, but I need to get up and get started on this project. I need to get up early and go look for a job. The early bird gets a worm. So a guy has got to temper his sleep. He can't always sleep eight hours every day. That might be ideal, but some days you're going to have things come up. Why? Because life has problems. And you, you're going to have some issues. Life you got to deal with. And you've got to temper everything in your life to meet your responsibilities. Okay? So, uh, does a man need to, besides sleep, does a man need to rest? Do we need rest during the day? On occasion, yeah, depending on, like, you know, I could, I could take a sledgehammer, and I've done this. I helped a man when I was work doing some side jobs to help pay the bills in Globe. Uh, I took, I, I, a guy wanted a, his, uh, carport concrete busted out because all cracked up so he wanted to bust it out and redo it and do it at a different level and so forth so I contracted him to bust out that concrete well I got me a sledgehammer and I hadn't used a sledgehammer in years but he was watching so boy I just went at it and oh, boom boom and just bust out that after a while I realized I can't keep going like this <laughs> And that eight-pound sledgehammer, after a while, it got kind of heavy. You know, it's, oh, I thought, well, that's not heavy. I can handle it. I could for about 20, 30 blows. But after that, well, all of a sudden, it felt like it was 100 pounds. <laughs> and, uh, and my back was starting to ache. The back of my legs were hurting. And, oh, man, and my hands weren't used to that jarring. And I realized I'm not in shape. So I had to take a break. Was it wrong to take a break? It would have been wrong not to. <laughs> I would have killed myself, okay? <laughs> so, had a heart attack or something. So, we have to temper everything we do. That's what's called setting a pace. Long, do do, uh, do uh, 100 yard dash runners have to pace themselves? No. It's too short. You run as, get out of the gate as fast as you can. You get that line as fast as you can. You give it all you got for. Well, I don't know what it is now. Five, six, ten, seven. It used to be ten seconds, but anyway, years ago. But, but now it's like I don't know what hundred yard dash is now. Anybody know? But I think they seven or eight seconds, something like that. Anybody know? know Nobody knows. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, I think for me it was like ten or back. You know, not now. It'd probably be a minute now. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, but no, you go full blast. Why? It's a short run. Now, wait a minute. How about the mile runners? Do they have to pace themselves? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then it's all about jockeying for position and getting inside lane and, and saving steps. And why? Because over a mile, and, you know, if you can get on the inside, if you're on the outside on a curve trying to pass a guy, well, you better make sure you don't burn up too much energy because the outside, it takes longer to go on the outside than the inside. So your lane position really, really matters. And you got to pace yourself because you can't run all out for a mile. And for the, and the guys that run marathons even more than a mile, that's even different. So they have to temper. they got to change the degree of speed, the rate of speed that they run. And so 
in all of our areas of life, we need to add temperance. I want to, by the way, you need to read your Bible with temperance. Don't say, I'm going to read the Bible, the whole Bible in a month. Well, if you have nothing else to do, you could probably do that. <laughs> but you're going to have to stick with it, you know, probably about 12 hours a day minimum. You're going to take breaks because you get tired of reading. So even if you did that, you still have to exercise temperance. You just have a, a higher degree of temperance than other people. But in your life, you need to add temperance to your Bible reading. Add temperance to, by the way, add temperance to your giving. I told that story when I was in Bible college. I heard a millionaire say, I give 90% of my income to God. Well, he's a millionaire. He could live on 10%. If you, can, if you make a million dollars in a year, can, can, can a person live off 100000 Easy. I mean, I'd, I'd, I feel like I'd be rich if I had $100,000 in a year. I've never even had half of that in a year. So, uh, so of course he could live off 100000 a year. No problem. It's, but I looked at that and so, said, wow, he gives 90%. I was making like 300 a week. So I said, well, I don't know if I can afford that. I, I can't. Well, maybe I'll, I'll. So I decided I'm going to start giving God 40%. So I gave God almost half of my paycheck. And one time, one time on especially, especially the thing, to, trying to raise money, our pastor said, hey, we're going to have in Thanksgiving. For Thanksgiving, we're going to have it one Sunday. I only do, so do this once. And don't do it every year, but just for this special problem, we're going to have a give it all Sunday. And as many as you people can't afford to give your whole, pay, give one week's paycheck. And if we get enough people to do that, we can meet, meet our goal. Well, so I decided, well, I want to do that too. So I gave it all. The problem was I wasn't paying my school bill. <laughs> my, my bill that it cost to go to Bible college. So I wasn't tempering. I should have listened. Okay, that's not for me. <laughs> By the way, when I preach, I'll preach some things, and everything's not for you yet at this time. There's some things you, you don't understand. You can't, you, you, it'd be really difficult for you to do, and you ought not do anything that you don't understand. Um, unless you're convinced that I'm right, then, then, then. but boy, you've got to be careful. But nobody was saying, give 40%. I chose that myself. And I was being temperate because I didn't give 90%, but I wasn't temperate enough for me to meet my obligations. For example, if you have an appointment with someone coming up, temper your time, how you spend your time. If you have an appointment at 3 o'clock and you have an appointment at 1 o'clock, then the person you spend your time with at 1 o'clock, make sure it doesn't go past 3 o'clock. Tell them goodbye about 2.30, 2.45 or so, so you can be there and temper yourself when you're with them so that you don't overrun and take up the space of the time you have set aside for someone at 3 o'clock. Does that make sense? Now, uh, and by the way, sometimes people who have appointments at certain times need to be temperate and allow, oh, I asked for this appointment, this person's really busy, and, well, it's after 3, I had an appointment at 3, how come, we're, how come he's not here? Well, you've got to be temperate and allow, sometimes emergencies do come up. Sometimes things take longer. That's why, by the way, you don't find... Anywhere in the Bible, I, I don't see much in the Bible about people being on time. I really don't. I think that's a mass production, factory type environment. All the Bible talks about the sun rises and the sun sets. Man goeth forth and doth his, does his work during the day. The Bible says, the night cometh when no man can work. Um, and that was before electricity was discovered. Um, uh, but anyway, so we need to temper everything, even our schedules. This idea of, of being so rigid, and, and I used to, when I was in Bible college, and of course, Bible college, they train you and teach you to, uh, to get character and to be punctual and all this stuff. And, and I did my best, but I never was real good at it. Why? Because I just, I thought, I, I'm just not that rigid. I can't make myself be that rigid and I don't want to be either now when I need to be I can be but if I don't need to be I'd rather be free I like freedom but I got at the same time got to temper freedom with responsibility so sun comes up sun sets there's a lot of time to do stuff so I, I remember having a schedule I had a little 
the six ring, those little six ring binders, you know, uh, for notepads and had line paper. And I organized and, and uh, someone, someone created and I, I, I bought a set from a guy of a bunch of sheets where it takes your, has all the hours of the day broken up in 10 minute segments. And boy, I made a detail. I still have a copy in my office. I, I, I blocked out time, you know, like you do a day timer or, or a, a scheduler nowadays. And I did that and I lived by that as best I could. I was never perfect at it, of course, but at least I had something. And by the way, I do highly recommend that you schedule your life, schedule your activities, and, but use temperance and diligently choose. Be diligent in choosing your options and weighing your options and, and allow temperance to be a part of your life. Otherwise, here's what happens. People that are too rigidly scheduled, when they start getting under pressure because, oh, I've got a deadline, what do they do? They stress out. Stress is very destructive to the human soul. See? That's why God told the children of Israel, if one of your brothers waxes poor, um, Luke begins to lose his finances and end up where he can't, he's got to move out and he's, got to, he's going to be sold for debts that he's got to, you buy him. Or if you buy him, and you ought to try to so some stranger, foreigner doesn't, um, and you buy his debt and he's got to come work for you, God says, thou shalt not make him serve with rigor. No rigid schedule. Schedule, yes. Rigid, no. What does that tell us? God doesn't want us to be rigid. He wants us to be flexible. That's what temperance is all about. I know many times Bible colleges have it, and, and the one I went to was, was, was good at this. Uh, I needed it, but for some people, they just couldn't take it. And they developed bad attitudes. Why? Because the rigidity of the rules. That's why we have grace. That's why grace is needed. We need to be gracious. Man, I, and, and people don't understand that sometimes the, the, the rules are created... And, and, and I'm not knocking the rules. I'm just saying we have to have temperance too. And a lot of people uh, got mad at the pastor. I know Brother Hiles has been criticized. Oh, he's too rigid. No, he wasn't. Personally, he wasn't. He, he used schedule to help people, to train, to develop people. But I'll tell you one time, I, was, I had an appointment with him. I cut his hair regularly for 10, 10 years. Now, one day I was late, but I knew I was going to be late, so I stopped at the gas station on the way and called, and I didn't have his number, of course, uh, his private number. So I called, but they had a security guard that had a phone, and so I called the security guard there, and I said, hey, would you, uh, would you, um, at, when, when, when Brother Hiles comes out for, to, to let me know he's ready for me to cut his hair, would you let him know I'm running about a minute late, a minute or two? Would you let him know so he's not like, oh, where's, where's Brother Coleman? All right, would you, would you let him know? So I, I did that. And then we, I got back in the truck and, and hurried on there. And I got there late as usual. And uh, so I knocked on the door. The security guard said, Brother Howell said, just knock on the door when you get here. So I knocked on the door. And Brother Howell opened the door. And I went in and began cutting his hair. While cutting his hair, he said, he said so, uh, so what was the problem? Did you have you, you had a problem with your, uh, what was your problem? I said, well, my muffler fell off. And I remember, you, remember hearing you talk about how, a diligent man or a, a leader, when he sees a problem, he solves problems. And so when my muffler fell off and was in the middle of the road, I had to stop, turn around, go back and not leave it in the road, but pick it up. And besides, you know, I didn't know if it was bad or just some part of the pipe that rusted. So I picked it up, put it back in the pickup truck. And I was running, you know, real close on my schedule. So that put me behind. So I stopped at the gas station, called, and I didn't want you to be waiting on me for the time it took me to, to, to clear the road of, the, of my... Uh, car parts that fell off. But anyway, so I explained that to him. And so afterwards, he, he didn't say anything. He didn't chew me out. He didn't look at me. Hey, what are you late for, man? I'm a busy man. I got the world's waiting on me. What are you, what's wrong with you, son? You're fired. No, he didn't do that. No, he asked about it. Why? He's doing like the judge we talked about in the Bible. Said, he did diligent search of the matter. He didn't make a judgment call just like that. And so he made diligent search and uh, asked me about it. I told him, 
And uh, so when we got all done, um, I went to shake his hand at the door, and he's let me out, and, and uh, he handed me a $100 bill. He said, here, go get your new muffler, and don't be late again. That was it. Like, man, those guys get, would be so afraid of getting chewed out. But he knew I loved him. He knew I did my best and that something happened I couldn't control. So what? He tempered his authority. He ruled just a sixteenth of an inch and blessed me with, he said, I don't know how much mufflers cost. Oh, he actually asked me and I said, I don't know, maybe $20, $30 back then. He gave me a $100 bill. That's pretty generous. <laughs> that more than covered the cost of muffler. Because I, I, remember, I remember now it cost me $19.95 at Kmart. <laughs> back then. So I got a blessing. Why? That's the way he really was. But people who go to a college and don't get that personal touch, they get critical. Why? Because they don't temper their judgments either. It's funny how people don't temper their judgments and then they criticize someone who's actually being temperate. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, temper Add diligence, or uh, temper diligently. Be diligent in deciding all your options to the degrees to which you do things. All right, then uh, real quick, patience. You need to add patience diligently. In other words, there's some times when you should be patient. Sometimes you don't want to be patient. Sometimes you want to, uh, uh, okay, let's see. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, there are times when, for example, when you've told someone to do something uh, several times already and they're still not doing it right, then you need to let them see, look, I don't have any patience. That's how, you know, okay, people get fired. Why? The boss finally loses patience with someone's failures. See, someone's sloppiness. Say, so, you know what, you, 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 you need to go work for someone else. We have higher standards than you, apparently you have. So... Appreciate your work. We'll pay you for your work, but we're looking for someone who has higher standards of quality work. So I'm sure there's other people that have lesser standards, and I hope you find a good job, but you're done here. <laughs> now, that comes after the boss has seen time after time after time when no, no quality. And uh, so, so even patience, you do diligently. You, 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 you choose thoroughly when to exercise patience when not and then you add to patience godliness same thing everything that every attribute of god we cannot all copy all the time so we got to choose which ones we're going to work on choose our priority which one you want to work on most and i'm running out of time so i'm not going to um, go into that uh, but I, I would recommend you highly give that some thought what godly traits that you want to Add to your life and then choose one to work on. Maybe you can work on one with higher priority and work on another one a little bit in the back of your mind a little bit whenever you get. And, uh, and, and make a list and ask God to help you which ones to focus on. And then add to your godliness brotherly kindness. Learn how to show kindness to your brother. In, and it's talking about brotherly kindness, brother in Christ. So learn how to develop levels of kindness and choose which kindness is to show to a brother. We can't, you know, for example, I, I don't have the money, but if I had the money, I'd take care of it. every need I ever find out about anybody in this church that has. I would. I just, if you have a need, just let me know. Come see me. I'll fill your need. <laughs> That's a, but, now, God's not that way. Why? Because if that happened pretty soon, people would be mooching off me in no time, right? <laughs> so, even your brotherly kindness, you have to temper that. You've got to be diligent and choose thoroughly. Oh, shall I, I've helped so-and-so. He came to me and wanting some money. He's behind on his rent again. It's like this the third month in a row. I think this time I'm not going to give him anything. Do you know that would also be Kindness. Not helping somebody when they say they need it, but they've been mooching off of you for so long already, and then saying, cutting off, hey, I'm not going to, 
enable you to keep on mooching off me. You're actually doing them a kindness. See, there are some people that, that uh, are having lots of problems in their life. And I want so bad to help, but they're not seeking help. So what do I do? I wait until it's hurting bad enough where they have to seek it. And I'm actually being kind because people have to learn to face the reasons why. If, otherwise, we have a welfare state. See? So I'm much more generous than I'm able and sometimes than I show. And that's because sometimes people need to learn to do for themselves. Figure it out. Solve your own problems. That's why when people come to me for counseling, I'm not the kind of person. If you want somebody to come and tell you what to do, don't come see me. Because <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to do. I may give you tools to where you can decide. I may give you principles from the Word of God, and you're going to make the decision, not me. That's why I don't carry counseling insurance. Why? Because I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. So no one's going to be able to go and say, hey, I followed so-and-so's advice, and he told me. No, I didn't tell you anything. I just told you what the Bible says. You decide. It's on you. Sue yourself. <laughs> See? Why? Because that's wisdom. I don't tell anybody what to do. I may suggest, but hey, suggestion is, you get that from your neighbors all the time, so co-workers. Anyway, then lastly, I think lastly, add to brotherly kindness, charity. And charity is a little bit different, but it's, it's, it's an all-encompassing love. It's a deep love. And, and how you show that love is very similar to brother, brotherly kindness, very similar. You still have to temper that. God is the only one that does not have to temper anything that he does. Well, he, even he tempers everything. But when, when God showed his love to us, he didn't temper it. Because his love required that he pay the full price of sin. And Jesus didn't make a partial payment for sin. He suffered an eternity's worth for all of us. Eternity's worth of, of, of suffering in hell. He suffered it all for all of us. He didn't spare. The Bible says, and God spared not. He who spared not his own son, how shall he not freely give us all things? So, so I hope this is a help to you. Take that uh, list there and, and keep it fresh in your mind. Make some cards or something in your house and put one in, in one room, another in another room, or someplace on the bathroom mirror and you know, on your refrigerator. And, 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 and temper that throughout your house and, and learn to have these ingredients on your mind and then do diligent uh, uh, Choose, choose thoroughly. Thoroughly choose your options and how you're going to exercise each of these and add these to your life. Because if you add these things, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he's purged from his own sins. His old sins. You know, it's sad when I visit people sometimes in their homes, and or I'm out door knocking, and I come across a Christian, and I ask him, I said, uh, where, do you have a church home? Well, no. I said, uh, or th th they'll say no, and I uh, haven't gone to church much lately, um, but I'm a Christian. Oh, really? Well, you know, for sure, if you died, you go to heaven? Oh, yeah, I trusted Christ my Savior years ago, but I've just not been going to church much lately, and uh, they may give a reason or not, but I, I can tell things aren't right in their life. They're not prospering. See, things aren't going well. Why? They, they've, they've forgotten in a sense. They're, they're living as if Jesus never did anything for them. They don't honor him. See, when you realize that Jesus died for you and suffered in your place, you'll want to do something for him. You'll want to serve. You'll want to go and, and hear more about him. You'll want to learn more about him. And you'll want to be in church. You'll want to fellowship with other people who believed in him too. You'll want to. I don't understand people that don't go to church. I just don't understand. To me, it's like they forgot they've been purged by their sins, if they were at all. They certainly are. It doesn't mean that much to them, and that's sad. So let's be diligent and let's add to our 
faith these things. Father, I'm going to quit. I pray that you bless the message to our lives, such an enriching, such potential of enrichment in our lives to where we can be fruitful, full of fruit in the knowledge of God and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us, we pray. And I pray that someone is, you have pointed out some need in someone's heart and life of something they're lacking. Help them to pursue that and make a decision today. They're going to uh, start working on a certain thing or resolve a certain issue in their life. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.